One of the first ways we had the ability to record video was using cine cameras like this that you wind up after putting some film in them and you can take a, a short silent video or movie film get that developed and then project it using your 8mm film projector and uh, then shortly after that video cameras started appearing first in black and white then in color and they followed the cine camera style very closely with this pistol grip and the VTR start stop button similar to how that worked if you take off the handle you can use the camera on a tripod trigger it like that or single frame exposure quite interesting so that design continued with the handle, the trigger, and same form factor with the lenses. And then became newer. That's got the the cable on it, which goes to the VCR. So you plug that into your VCR that has a 10-pin camera connector on it. And as National Panasonic's version with a slide zoom lens. And then eventually the, they developed into the more normal or more modern style of camera where there's a hand strap and you hold it this way instead of holding it by the handle. And then eventually CMOS sensors came along or CCD sensors, MOS video camera in the more common style. Again, 10 pin camera plug. And then there's the National Panasonic one, CCD camera in this style. Just a camera. The cable plugs in there, which goes to your VCR. So the type of VCR you'd use with these is like this this Panasonic one, VH, full size VHS tape, battery in there, camera plugs in there with the 10 pin connector. The JVC one is quite interesting because it's got a another plug on it. Not sure what that was, whether that's an audio in or out thing or uh, the pause, maybe. Uh, anyway, plug that into your VCR. You put the battery in. You get a shoulder strap around here, and you haul this around with you, with your camera, and you can record video. When you get home. You plug your VCR into a timer tuner. So this has all the other features that a normal home VCR would have. The clock, timer and tuner. And then it's got a cable on it. Which plugs into the back of the portable VCR. And then that turns it into with the combination of those two things become a standard home VCR with all of the features that you expect on a home VCR but with the convenience that you can take the the tape transport part away and use it with your video camera quite convenient you don't need to own two VCRs then we got Mitsubishi and they decided well I don't know what they did actually but what they ended up with was Instead of having the convenience of separating the tuner and timer part from the VCR, why not just leave them all together in one big heavy unit that you can just carry around with you? So we have this, which is Mitsubishi. Yeah, this one's an HS700. And it's a full VCR in a unusual form factor with a handle on the top. And it's got a... 10 pin camera plug on it and in the other side it's got a panel where the power supply lives and you can unplug that pull it out and put a battery in its place and plug into there 12 volts so you can tr carry the whole thing with you it's pretty heavy and then use your camera connected to it and while I was digging out these cameras which is a lot of them. Plastic tubs, whatever you call them. Totes. Full of these cameras. Heaps and heaps of video cameras. So we'll do teardowns of those eventually. 
But I found, I didn't even know that I had this, a Mitsubishi camera. This is probably one of the ones that goes with this VCR. And it's lost its pistol grip. I don't know whether I ever had that, but I don't think I have it now. Uh, but see what happens here. That screws in there, and there's a locating post. And then there's this thing there, which looks like a lens release lever. But uh, what I think there is, is when you put the grip on, the trigger button on it will push in there. And so when you don't have the trigger on, if you're mounting it on a tripod, you can push that to start and stop the VTR. Bizarrely, it has a power zoom. And yeah, even though that's right there, it's got zoom controls and it will be manual focus. Telescopic microphone. So that's quite exciting. And standard 10 pin plug. Now this power supply that we pulled out of the VCR does not work because I already tested that. It provides the extra stuff like the filament filament AC for the VFD and negative voltage which will be used for VFD and probably for the tuner maybe. Uh, maybe that's what 50 volts is used for. Uh, that will be the main one to pry the VCR. So when you're using it by a camera you don't get any of that tuner or any clock functionality, it just works as the VCR only. But that power supply is burned out. Well, it's failed. As a tuner setup thing in the top there. But, from the magic of owning more than one of these, I've got another power supply. I used to have another whole VCR, but that already got scrapped some time ago. And I found some pretty horrifying things inside it. There are NICADs, I think they're NICADs, inside this. And that leaked and completely ruined the circuit boards. Uh, so because of that, I have very little... I don't think this is going to work. Anyway, I found another power supply, which is the same one. For some reason, someone's cut the cord off of it. So I found a random power cord and joined that up in a not too dodgy manner. So that doesn't look very good, does it? And this one does seem to work, so we can power this up. See, it's got feet on the the back of it, so you can put it front up. Let's plug it in. Switch it on. Now the clock is flashing. We can switch on the power. Nope. Okay. Well, there we go. On doesn't eject. You can hear a motor going, so the belt must be slipping. So there you go. Uh, what we should do though, is see does this does this camera work? Because I don't know, I didn't even know I had this. And there's switches on the back. Switches between camera and VTR, and there's operate or power save. I wonder if that puts the VCR into standby, maybe. I'll get some video cables sorted out, and we can then try the camera. It's got a bit of a, a JVC feel to it, with a DIN connector for the audio in out, and which is something that they do. And although the video in and out is is not BNC, it's RCA's. So got an adapter there, so I can join that on. Get the thing going. The thing. Alright, let's plug in the camera and see what happens. Presumably you're allowed to do that live. Okay, there's light in the viewfinder. No lens cap on there. Oh, the stoplight is flashing. It's not just me. Oh, it's probably because of the error caused by the belt slip. Anyway, I'm not seeing any signal. There doesn't seem to be anything coming out of this. Okay, second plan. Use this thing. It's very dusty. It's a camera adapter thing. Hopefully it works. Yeah, it comes on. Plug the camera into that. And now we need some sort of joiner though to join that wire on. I will find something. Huh, that's gone blue now. That's weird. Anyway, 
I don't think this camera works because if it did, there'd be some sort of response happening on the viewfinder, wouldn't there? Which there isn't. Does the view? Oh yeah, yeah look at that. The power zoom works. And I don't think these are set to anything. The manual. Yeah, you can disengage the power zoom. So it's A. You can put on M. Doesn't move. The manual iris control is doing nothing. Uh, yeah, I don't think the camera works, and I don't think the VCR works. Let's do a teardown of the VCR. That seems like a logical next step there. But, if we get the, um, the thing open and have a look, we might be able to find Slipping Belt and replace it with something else and see if this loads up and plays. But my notes on this machine say no picture. So the last time it would, it did load up a tape, it wasn't able to produce a picture, so... And, yeah, as I said, the, the batteries inside it that were leaking, and I also remember seeing in the other one that I had that the capacitors were all leaking too. So, great. The hidden screw there. I was wondering, is there screws under the feet? I don't think so. It's a pretty heavy thing, this. It's as heavy as a regular, like, tabletop home VCR. And it doesn't seem to have shoulder strap holes, so I guess you just got to carry it around with you. Seems there's an input for charging the battery that's inside it. I'm pretty sure that's what that will be. Doesn't let me see. It just says charge, unless that's an output for charging the battery when the power supply is in the machine. I suppose that would be make more sense, would it? We might be able to determine that by looking at the circuit. Nope. We might need to take that cover off. I don't think so. Okay. Look at this good stuff. Something happened at one point in 1994, 11th of the 5th month. Look at that, the camera connector dipped down there. There must be a switch in there so that when you push the camera plug in, it presses a switch. Yeah, you can see it in there. There is a tab kind of thing there that must go down to there and there'll be a switch so it can switch over because there's a um, switch there to go between auxiliary and TV so when you have it on TV it means it's getting video from the tuner you put it on auxiliary and it's getting its video input from this connector and when you plug the camera in it will switch that off and start input from here I think we'll do another video after this one where we take apart the camera. Good getting this front off. There's a 0.22 ohm resistor. I wonder if that's to do with seeing how much current's flowing and regulating the charge. Okay, the front fell off. And then you can undo these screws. And the control panel part comes off. Maybe. Oh, there's more screws. That's not a hinged thing. It cannot be unhinged. Okay. Then there's a cover. Someone's had to go on with the wrong screwdriver and munted it. Awesome. It's all JIS, remember? JIS only or you'll wreck it. This has got a really weird video head where the motor part is on the top. It also has a weird chassis where the it's mostly plastic. I suppose they were trying to reduce the weight of it, but uh, it's not really, it's still a pretty heavy thing. Now I'm pretty sure those batteries that leak are under this. Yep, there's the batteries. Oh, and they don't look in that bad uh, shape. This one is in a lot better condition than the other one that I had, which it 
this was just all green and corroded all down there it is traveling up the wires i think not not a huge amount so we'll get rid of these that's a lot tamer than i expected it to be there's a bit of corrosion on the terminals not a lot well, that's lucky maybe this is more recoverable than i thought anyway we'll see now right, let's get into this and see if we can see what's slipping is there a belt somewhere now maybe the best way to get to that is is to look in the back mm, i guess i don't know we'll just lean on the front one We can just undo this, and then it will uh, fold back. A bit optimistic. Oh, there's spider webs all in there. There's oh, it's got a clip. Okay, look at that. Oh, they got a bit of. Oh, this is one that I've been in before. I've replaced that motor. Look at that. A really long time ago. Yeah. Interesting, yeah, because that, that's not normal, is it? And there's a join there that I put tape on. Yeah, I don't remember doing this, but this is definitely something that I must have done. There aren't any belts there. Well, there's one down there for the mechanical uh, mechanical counter, capstan motor. At the bottom of the head there, there's the... EG, whatever they call it, FG feedback thing. Remove this screw to replace fuse. Hmm, there must be a fuse down there. Let's see what that's all about. Ah, there's a board. It's this board here. And there's a relay, and there's two fuses on it. And there's some corrosion on one of the fuse clips. You can see the fuses there. There's some kind of power supply business. There aren't no belts visible there. It must be hidden. Okay, I can see it now. There's a pulley there on a motor. Uh, yeah, and the belt's gone real squidgy. Okay, so we'd have to take the whole mechanism out in order to get to that. Uh, there's a squished wire there. It's been damaged from something squishing it. See when the front was put back on. Okay. Yeah, I wonder then if it was me munting these screws way back when I took it apart to replace that motor. Quite a bit of it would have had to come apart for that. Oh yeah, yeah I guess I didn't put... Oh, okay, so you don't have to take much apart there. You can get to the screws. I guess I had another machine that had the same type of motor in it that I took it from. But we're gonna have to take the whole mechanism out if we want to access that belt. Let's see, there's these bigger screws here. And there's another one here. That might be all that holds it in, but there's all the wires. I think this part here is the motor drive for the head drum. Oh, that's a long screw on that. Oh yeah, and then there's a sensor of where the position that uh, pinch roller is. See, there's the loading motor. There's a belt on the back to there. I remember this. It's got a hole. Um, ring gear around there which drags all this stuff around and must eventually trigger the eject mechanism. And it's a bit juicy looking down the bottom there with all kinds of dust and stuff. Yeah, quite a lot of things are going to have to come out now. I still don't know if it's worth actually repairing this or do we just sort of just take it apart just for fun. How are we going to know where all the wires go? Uh, they've got codes written on them. What that is, it looks like audio. Yeah, that must be the audio board there. Oh, 
of that, oh, is that the other side of that power supply board with the fuses? Yeah, it is. That looks like the tuner there. That's all the timer stuff. There must be an IC under there. Yes, there is. And then that there must be servo or something. Maybe it looks like lots of motor drive thingies on there. And it might also be a system control thing. And then that back big board will be all the video stuff. These wires are wrapped around each other. They don't all go to the mechanism. They only go to other places. Oh, that's going to have to come out as well. Now there's... There's these clips down here which bring all sorts of cables down to these backboards and then there's metal covers don't where the video signals coming off the head and there's cable ties uh, but then a bunch of the wires just go under all that stuff I don't know what that is, it seems to just be this brown wire here it seems to just be soldered, where does that go to? Oh, the grounding thing. Okay, so there's a screw here with some ring terminals on it. So there's some grounding wires that weirdly they've coloured them brown and red. So it looks like power supply stuff. A lot of stuff to undo. I'll just keep undoing all the stuff. I'm guessing they didn't intend a belt to be to either need replacing. Maybe they hoped it never needed replacing. Usually belts. Uh, well, no, it's not. Belts are usually quite hard to replace. Seems like a thing that's overlooked. <laughs> Everything just goes to little tiny connectors. It's not all brought together and then goes on one larger cable. It's all its own little individual two and three pin connectors. Can't get to the connector on on the capstan motor board. Oh, look, we can pull it out. Okay, we can get to it. We won't be able to put it back in though. I think that's everything from the bottom undone. But there's a bunch of stuff that comes from the top. And then those, and then there's a couple of others. That one, there's a red and black wire. Ah, look at that. There we go. That's a really crusty belt. It's finished. So do we put a new belt in there and then try and put all this back together and see if it works? Or are we just done with this thing? We'll take out the mechanism and investigate it. I, I think we're done with it because it's here. Yeah. We're just going to have a, a little look at this thing and then we're finished. We've also got to take a look inside the power supply. Oh, the, the, uh, yeah, wires just twisted together with tape on them. Awesome. Okay, so this is the husk of the chassis and the remaining boards and things that are in it. Yeah, it's a uh, cable tied onto the chassis. Have to, we'll have a look at the mechanism first, then we'll get that back. Okay, it's got a VCR mechanism here. Now, it's a pretty strange one because it's all a plastic base. Now, I'm not sure what way that needs to turn to do anything. Okay, so that's loading direction. You can see there's two counter-rotating rings inside there to do the loading so the 
The one that rotates that way is bringing that up, and the other one that rotates that way is bringing that up. If we go back to the unwind position, we should be able to get the, the unthread position direction. I guess that pulls tape out there past the pinch roller. Oh, it just gets stuck. Ah, is it? Oh no, here we go. Yeah, it's just... That's just a bit gummed up. Okay, we'll take the loading assembly off. I'm going to scrap this machine because, yeah, I've got far too many and it's not really worth it. Let the right screws to undo. There you go. There you go. So there's a switch there to detect something. It must be when it's ready to eject or it's being put back. It's a little leaf switch sort of thing. Then there's the mechanical counter, which was just directly driven like that off of the take-up. Oh yeah, look at that. That's It goes through one gear reduction from the motor. So it's just direct driven. Direct dri drive for the supply spool. And the back tension will be done by this optical interrupter there. So that's quite a, a neat modern way of doing it. No back tension band to go bad like you get in so many of the other machines. Just a little optical sensor, that a bit on that, yeah, that lever thing there, once it's threaded up, we'll just pass between that and just keep a small amount of torque oscillating up and down on that motor. And for the take up, it's that. So it's just working on the slip of the motor, and it's barely energized to make a take up. I guess there was. Yeah, a tiny little split washer on there to hold that on, which I guess that had, and I must have lost it or broke it. There is a die cast piece in here. Just a little bit. Just for the bits that need to be kept fairly solid in it. Precise. A little bit that helps open the flap on the tape. That little thing. It's got a smooth edge on it there, so that the lid can slide open. Now what actuates the pinch roller? Is there a solenoid? No, I don't think so. It must just be pushed by those loading rings once they get to a certain position. Now the head motor on this is on the top. Data. Like that. And then the heater. I think this is a little PTC heater thing. Just to keep the drum warm. This one's just, it is a heater, it's not a power regulator that happens to provide a little bit of heat. This actually is a heater. Oh, that's got its own thing, they call it DC. DA for the stator there. Oh, it's got the little grounding thing in the center. And you can see the three Hall Effect devices, and then some coils that this magnet will follow as they energize. And recycle these metals. Does that come out with two screws? Wow. But we have to take this bit off the bottom. The flywheel, and it's got a little magnet embedded in it for the pickup so that the rotation speed can be sensed and controlled. Yeah, just a little flywheel. Very disassemblable. And terminal cover. Just two heads. The four wires coming off for that. Shielding. Not very much thread engagement on those, like barely a turn. Bracket thing. Bottom of the head we need a hex to get that off. Yeah, I remember in this machine the head was in really bad condition. Had a continuous black line all the way around it, which I cleaned off as much as I could. But you can see it's still pretty bad shape. So, yeah, there was this machine never worked very well, and the whole time I had it, I think it's really worn heads, very worn. All right, I want to have a look at the loading rings under this assembly. And because it's a weird head, you can't just stick in another one from a Panasonic machine or whatever. It's a strange arrangement. I don't think this is going to come off that easily, is it? 
probably have to take, I don't know, this pinch roller thing off. E clips off without munting my fingers too much. Oh, what is holding this down? Oh, it might be the the uh, tape guides. Okay, they're off. Um, it's probably the the capstan motor, isn't it? Because that's got a whole board under there. Let's see if that pops off. So it's common in Mitsubishi machines to have these direct drive. I remember another and a tabletop machine that I dismantled many years ago, probably more than 25 years ago. Would it be like mid 90s? And yeah, I remember being surprised at how that had individual motors for the reels, and it was a DC motor for the capstan as well, which was quite interesting. Direct drive DC motor on the capstan. I hadn't seen one before with so many individual motors in it because I'm used to the more efficient Panasonic one where they uh, don't have individual reel drives and the older stuff. There's the motor drive, HA11715 maybe? Or was it that HA11714? I guess they work together. One of them is probably the power stage, probably that because it's got the heatsink. It's one of those um, dip packages that's got wings sticking out of it. Thick metal pins to heatsink the die. Although well, that seems to have heat sinking legs on the ends as well. There's another little TI thing, which I think that's just an op amp. LM2903. Sounds like a comparator, doesn't it? Exciting motor. Now that probably comes off. Yes, look at that. Oops, poor spring got destroyed. Oh, well, there you go. There's the, the back tension um, sensing, which went into that. Thingy that's gone somewhere, this thing, the little light interrupter, photo interrupter. Okay, look at that, some of this stuff popped up out of the way. It's like a bone. So it's two concentric rings, and there's a worm under here off that pulley. And so those move around and it drags the loading arms up. And then there's some dents in it that control these other things. There's the brakes, which get controlled by this sub wheel off of it there. That will release the brakes and apply the brakes at, depending on the play, pause, or cue review modes. Those motors come out. Oh, look, there's a little gasket thing there. There wasn't one on that side. Great, now let's put it all back together. Uh, maybe not this time. That's the record prevention switch there. Erasure, erasure prevention. So that will fall into the hole in the corner of the cassette and push on that switch. Pushes on the switch if it doesn't fall into the hole. A little metal spring around it. Brakes. Little brake pads there. Very well used. Extremely well well used little brake pad things. Now I want to take these rings out because they're interesting. Split washer holding that little gear in. Okay. So it doesn't even do a full turn, it does just about a third of the turn. This is wrecked. Oh, you see, someone's put a mark there, so those must line up. I guess we should have done it in the unload position. <laughs> Too late now. I was wondering is, can we pull the worm drive out, worm gear out, so that we can just free run it? Okay, so now pulling on that, we'll turn the other one. Oh, it's got a spring as well. What's the home position for this? There'll be some holes somewhere. Maybe it's that. There's a slot there. Then maybe you line that hole up with the slot. Nah, 
Yeah, I'm not sure what you line it up with. A service manual somewhere will tell you what you need to do there to get it in alignment. And it looks like the yeah, the pinch roller was just triggered by this piece here. So maybe that's the... Yeah, it'll be that, won't it? Because that's up the top there to get it into the play position. You yeah, when those are up like that. And that's getting to the, the end of its travel. So that will be pushing on something that I've already pulled out. And that will pull on that to put the pinch roller into position, squeezing against the capstan. And then as it comes down to the unload position, then it will stop doing that. Oh, it's that channel there. One of those. Anyway, so that's got an over-travel spring into it so that the mechanism, once it's reached the loaded position, fully loaded, then the mechanism can still move a bit so it can go into pause mode where it releases off the pinch roller. Or is that Q review mode? Releases the pinch roller, something like that, while still keeping it in the fully threaded up position. Same on that. Yes, so that's all very sticky. We'll take a look at the circuit boards next. Let's take a look at the circuit boards that come out of the VCR. Looks like there's some kind of stickiness on there. No, it might just be flux. Or what's left of the flux residue after all these years. So this hinged out on this metal bracket, which has been disconnected. Get all this stuff out of here. Right, that was the audio board, and then there was that other one. The power supply, something or other board. Oh, there are some regulators along the top. That's an aluminium plate. Yeah, so this back stuff, servo, this part, and then this part, YC. So the video section. And these things are held on by the little push pin clip thingies. That is more though. Oh, because it's also got the shielding plate thing. Well, that will get them started at least. So we can pull these out. Some genuine bodges. Some extra components. I mean, put in little insulating tubes so they don't short anything out. The bodge wire there. Yeah, it's not on the silk screen, so it is some. Maybe they forgot a connection. As if it's a genuine link, then they would put. It'll be part of this, the layout, like these ones are, they're numbered and they have actual pads for them. And a bit more stuff. And I think this will have to come out from the other side, will it? That's the, the RF modulator. And then the tuner stuff is in there. Okay, yeah, so there's three thingies there, power regulators. And how is this attached? Oh, it's held in place by this front board here with the LEDs on it, which show you what channel it's selected. And the insulating sheet. Oh, and there's a clip. Really well attached in that bit. Okay. Oh, it's because of the mold. You can't make it in closed part in an injection mold because you wouldn't be able to separate it. So that piece has to be added in after. This is separate because the mold will come down to this level. Great, there we go. The chassis has been liberated. Signal came in off the video head there. And then there's chips and things to sort all that out. So it's all done on one board. The only one that wasn't very well identified is this one. Which I guess is system control TI chips. TMS1024 Is that some kind of microcontroller? And then some other thing And some logic chip TC4011 14503 14503 Some logic business I've got this power regulator thing yeah, That looks like it's going a bit crusty Oh, there's leaked capacitors there Yeah, it's corroding yeah, that's a shame. That's not to do with the batteries though. That's... Yeah, the legs of resistors there have gone all crusty. The 9 volt relay. Ah, so that's why there was corrosion on the um, the fuse clips. 
It's just the electrolyte from the capacitors spreading out and infecting everything. Where's the TV tuner? Probably a whole self-contained TV tuner. And with those two shielded wires being the audio and video output. That's what I reckon. Up to here. Yeah, that makes sense because it's right by that switch that chooses whether it's set to TV or auxiliary in. Yeah, there goes the wires. The connections go straight to that switch. Okay, so that's that's all of a TV tuner. Somewhere is the up-down buttons. That's on this part, isn't it? To choose the channel. Channel up and down there. So the signal from that. Let's go all the way down to this the timer board. And then maybe... Oh no, it's got its own wires going from there up to there. I wonder if that is directly going to those buttons or whether it goes through some other business. And then there's this chip, UP NEC chip. So it must be a microcontroller. Probably something that's... well it might not be a microcontroller. It might be something with a dedicated TV tuner selector thing. So what will happen is these are variable resistors set as potentiometers and which are the ones selected probably some sort of analog multiplexer thing in that whichever one is selected will provide a voltage from the potentiometer and apply it to the tuner module and then that will set the frequency that it will be tuned to so when you're changing the channel it's just changing which reference voltage from these gets applied to the tuner oh it actually tells you the pinout on there there's audio, video, AFC switch, AFC, B plus, AGC delay, AGC, and IF. Interesting, although not very useful anymore because you can't, they don't do analog TV anymore. And so what that has is an AFC switch. Something like that automatic fine tuning of automatic filter control AFC I don't know what they abbreviate that from but it's this thing here so when you open that little flap on the top of the VCR so you can adjust the tuning it switches off the automatic tuning adjustment so that you can get this to the maximum strength and then when you close the lid again it switches back on the auto fine tune control so it can uh, make it slightly better if you haven't quite Hit the mark when tuning it in. These things here switches that chooses the band. The VL, VH or UHF. I'm not sure exactly how that relates to the outputs on this. Whether that band is a different thing or is that a pre-selector on the resistor, the resistance. I guess we should smash that thing open so we can find out. Not like we're going to use it, is it? Oh, it's, it's it can't easily be opened because there's screws screwing the plastic top onto the circuit board part and you can't get to them. Oh, that's annoying. I'm guessing it's a pre-selector because there's only three terminals per thing. Oh, there's, there's three coming in there. So, yeah, it's got more stuff going on. Maybe that. They'll come off this. So, yeah, maybe that also picks up something to do with the switches anyway that doesn't really matter it's a tuner module and it works on the principle of a voltage reference is sent from these and that sets what it tunes into we can stop fiddling around with that now so there's the timer the clock with the vacuum fluorescent display there's another ti chip under there for it mpi 289 maybe Possibly 1983-27th week. Does that correlate with the other stuff that we saw on this board? Nope. Oh yeah, this one, 8329. Yeah, 8323. I guess it's a 1983 unit. Yeah, it's similar on these Motorola chips. And this Mitsubishi chips. That's the motor drive for the head drum. It's got one of those ICs with the heatsink arms attached to a heatsink on the other the capstan motor so i think this is the same chips isn't it this set of two chips which would be one would be some controller thing and then they 
that one will be some power stage for driving the motor so that's interesting we should look at what these regulators are maybe they're just discrete transistors here they are 2SC1826 2SA768 presumably they're proper Senkin devices are like actual genuine parts the original not copies or imitations well, they're already stuck to the heatsink Silk pad things really glued them in. Were they glued in? I don't think so. I think it's just the pressure over the years. Something has dribbled out there. It's glue from or residue from that sleeve around the legs. Interesting bright green colored capacitors there. 47 nanofarads. Now we're going to look at See, was that charging thing an input or an output? There's bits of wire soldered into the board and just used as ties here. And there's the stuff from this power connector goes straight onto there. Which makes sense. Oh, even that from that. Oh yeah, that's the main power, isn't it? Yeah, confusing with... There's this other DIN plug there, which is called remote. There must be some wired remote that you can get for this VCR. Oh, that connector there doesn't go down to the board, it's in an assembly that seems to be then manually wired. Let's get that thing off. Okay, it's coming off. Okay, so that charge connector, another one of those twisty tie things, freestanding connector mounted on this. Yeah, so that does several things. It's, they're making use of the switch. On both of these connectors, some of the track goes all over the place. It must put itself in a charge mode when you plug into that. So I reckon the way that track goes all the way off to some chip must talk to something. And it takes one of the signals from this connector. No, I don't know exactly. Anyway, that's, that's the thing. Interesting that some of these are yellow, but the header part isn't yellow. Usually. I color code both ends so that makes it easier to join up because you just match the colors that way when there's multiple connectors with the same number of ways you can do it by color there's often a red red black white brown and black depends on the connector manufacturer and this last bit here is the RF modulator and so that as well will have an audio and video signal coming in then it will have a power supply and it will have a VTR signal so that it can switch from passing the aerial signal through to not passing it through instead uh, providing the RF modulated output out to the TV. Back in the day, this is from 83, not many TVs had a AV input so you had to tune in your VCR onto a channel some sort of modulator thingies, a saw filter. That's interesting, it's permanently attached there and it's an RCA plug on the other end. So that's bringing the aerial signal out to go into the tuner, the VCR's tuner. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff going on in there. It must be using the, the shield of these audio and video cables for the return for power because they haven't wired those two, which look like they join together and join to the case. Uh, economizing there I guess. Well, there might have been a path through the case but um, yeah probably because one of these ground wires. Great! And where does that come from? There. So that's the audio and video output. And on the bottom there's a little sub board. So make sure bits and pieces on it. And comb filter up on top of other parts. Save space I guess. Yeah, it's, it's not that high, so it probably could have just been sitting upright. I don't know if there was a reason for that. Great, so there you go, that's Mitsubishi HRS 700, I think. So it was something like that. Anyway, we'll take a look. Oh, we've got to do the power supply, haven't we? Can't finish yet. Okay, let's have a look inside the power supply. Mitsubishi VCR, kind of portable VCR power supply. It doesn't work. In the aluminium feeling enclosure. 
not multi voltage input this one is only 230 volts a bit weird normally especially on portable vcrs they put a uh, voltage range it's a wide input range because you travel with it okay so it's a die cast aluminium -y type of enclosure some heat sinking special molded piece there i'm guessing the problem with it's just the capacitors of finely dried up in it. A lot of flux residue on the board. There's not really that much going on in there. Thought there'd be a lot more output capacitors. I guess because it's only got one main output rail, that 14 volts and the others are just very low current, aren't they? Yeah, nothing above 100 milliamps. So 14 volts, 2.2 amps. 50 volts, 10 milliamps. Minus 12 volts, 30 milliamps. 4 volts, 100 milliamps. AC. I wonder how they do the AC. Whether that's created by some other oscillator thing. I wonder if that's what that's for. That is another transformery looking thing to the yellow wire. This doesn't tell you what wires go to what. No, I think that's a, actually a gate drive, gate drive transformer. So it looks like the controller for this is on the secondary there. The UPC1042 NEC thing. And then that goes over to there and then there's a well that's an scr isn't it gate anode cathode okay it's even more weird what is this thing the main switching device is there wait a minute no i was thinking does it have an, an auto switch for 110 volt operation because that's what you'd normally use normally a track to reconfigure the the bridge rectifier as a voltage doubler no, that can't happen on this one because there's only one input capacitor. Maybe it's just an overcurrent or over voltage clamp which shuts it off. That's possibly what's going on there. Then there's that which looks like a CT, maybe. And it might just be the feedback just using a transformer. Well, no, it will be a CT. The voltage feedback's on the all on the secondary and the controller's on the secondary. There's an inductor there. I guess it's a board converter in that case. The uh, the LC filter on the output. Looks like it might only have one. Oh no, it is multiple secondaries. Yeah, because it's got those three wires there floating around and then it's got those three little ones. Okay, so it's multiple. Of course it is because it has multiple outputs and the negative will need to be one of them. Anyway, that's enough rambling about that. It's an interesting power supply. Yeah, it's got some secrets to tell. Yeah, I'd have to spend some time tracing that out to understand what's going on. But, yeah. Shame it's not a bit more modular that we can disconnect this stuff easily. Yeah, there's sticky stuff. Get on that. No, no, it's the wire. The wire's gone all gross. Is that because it's been touching something on here? There's some sticky stuff. Yeah, on the... That's the rectifier. Little bridge rectifier. And then I think this this cable's going bad, which isn't surprising because the same thing's happening with a lot of the camera cables that I've got. They've all turned to this really horrible, mushy, sticky stuff. Shame! All this equipment is dying. Can't really do anything about it. Decomposing. Anyway, there is the Mitsubishi HR700, somewhat portable VCR. Next, we'll take a look at the camera, which I believe is one of the cameras that would have gone with that VCR. And we'll have a look what's going on inside there. I'm interested to see how the motor works with the zoom, since there doesn't seem to be much space in there for it. Anyway, that's next video. That was the VCR.